it, we call uh, communion a sacrament, which uh, for us as free Methodists, it means it's a means of grace. It's a time when we're doing exactly what Jesus told us what to do. Jesus said, whenever you get together, do this and do it this way. So we're kind of like lock and stepped with Jesus when we, we um, celebrate communion. And you can come over here, Jess. That's okay. I won't bite. And at least it's a communion Sunday. I, <laughs> I'm nice when it's communion Sunday. So it's a time for us where we consider it, it's a means of grace. It's kind of a special event for us. So as we celebrate communion, we don't believe it's, you know, your salvation's based on it or anything like that, but it, we believe it is a special time where God administers grace to us. And I don't know about you, but that's why I come to church to have a grace encounter with God, to know that I've come into the presence of the living God. So what I'm going to do today is just pray that God would prepare our hearts uh, to meet with him today during this table of the Lord, during this sacrament of communion. Then I'm going to give it over to Jess. Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your continued mercy and goodness to us. Thank you for all that you've done for us. And Lord, as we celebrate this sacrament of communion today, where we kind of go re refresh our minds and our hearts with the gospel through elements, through the tangible. Lord, minister grace to us here today. Many of us are, are tired. Many of us are hurting. Many of us have gone through pain this week. Many of us are maybe looking forward to things this week that aren't really pleasant. Lord, when we have an encounter with you, everything gets put into a different perspective. So I pray today for Communion Sunday that we will experience you in this means of grace. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Jess. The invitation goes out to you who are truly and earnestly repentant of your sins, who live in love and peace with the, your neighbors, and who intend to lead a new life following the com commandments of God and walking in his holy ways. Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and humbly kneeling, make your honest confession to Almighty God. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we confess that we have sinned and we are deeply grieved as we remember the wickedness of our past lives. We have sinned against you, your holiness and your love and we deserve only your indignation and anger. We sincerely repent, and we are genuinely sorry for all the wrongdoing and every fa failure to do the things we should do. Our hearts are grieved, and we acknowledge that we are hopeless without your grace. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, and for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us. Cleanse us. Give us strength to serve and please you in newness of life and to honor and praise your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us recite the Lord's Prayer as a confessional. We'll be using the terms debt and debtors. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, who gave in love your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who by the sacrifice offered once for all did provide a full, perfect, and sufficient atonement for the sins of the whole world. We come now to your table in obedience to your son, Jesus Christ, who in his, in his holy gospel commended us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we humbly ask and grant that we receiving this bread and cup as he commanded and in the memory of his passion and death may partake of his most blessed body and blood. In the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance for me. In like manner, we break the bread. 
In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many. For the remission of sins, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We're going to ask that you come up and receive the elements on my right and receive from Pastor Chris and myself. Please come forward. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one you can. You turn graves into gardens. The body of Christ. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. The body of Christ. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. The body of Christ. Nothing is better than you. The body of Christ broken for you. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you. There's nothing. The body of Christ. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh no, I don't want to live anybody to get to this. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you. Preserve your soul and body until everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed upon him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Let's take and eat together. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ which was shed for you. Preserve your soul and body until everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Let us take together. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of remembrance, of following your commands, that we're able to experience just a brief moment of what you had with your disciples that last supper before your sacrifice. We ask that as we continue in worship through song and hearing your word, that you continue with us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Dead religion, now there is living faith. 
Pastor Chris comes and shares your words with us. We ask that your spirit, which is moving so sweetly today, continue to speak to each of us. Breaking down walls, changing hearts, guiding us that we may be your light in this world. We ask this in your name. Amen. And you may be seated. Children, you are dismissed through the back doors.
Today's scripture reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve only him you shall serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is God's word. And all God's people said amen at the reading of God's word. Before we get started um, looking into God's word, we're going to talk to you about God's word. Last week, we brought up uh, some ideas and some Bible reading plans, and because we had a minor blizzard, winter showed up. Um, we just kind of want to reiterate that a little bit with you this morning. So I'm going to hand it off to Jess. She's going to talk to you about a Bible reading app. And some of you have kind of jumped right on that. Uh, it's a chronological approach to reading scripture. And then I'll go back to my old fashioned way where we use paper. But anyway, Jess, take it away. So back at the, back at the welcome desk, there is a on. Hey, there I'm on now. Back at the welcome desk, there is a printout of this. There is a printout of a chronological plan. You can either use a printout or the app. It's called the Bible Recap. The Bible Recap begins in Genesis, and there's a daily reading. It's about 20 minutes. That's it. So beginning with uh, Genesis, then it jumps to Job, and it jumps all around because it's putting in order the Bible as it occurs in events. So this is two ways that you can do it. One, if you are paper and want to do it in your Bible and check it off as you go, that's what I'm doing. That's my preference. You can also go on to version and download the app the Bible Recap. You can go to the website, The Bible Recap. That's all you need to know, The Bible Recap. In addition to the daily reading, there is also a devotional that goes along with it. It's about 10 minutes, give or take, anywhere from 8 to 10 minutes. Depends on how uh, winded she is. But she is wonderful to listen to. I know some people have already been jumping in. And it just gives a little bit of insight. Not much because she's not a seminarian, but she's giving, she's done this for many, many years. So this is real world. I'm reading the Bible every day. This is what I'm learning from it, and I'm sharing it with you. So that is the chronological plan, and Pastor Chris is going to share the Wesleyan inspired. The Wesley inspired. Well, it's actually a, um, a monastic uh, way of reading through the Bible in a year. Um, what it does is you read one proverb in accordance to the day. So today is the 14th, so you would read Proverbs 14. There are 31 Proverbs. So you're covered for the month. Then what you would do is then multiply the number, which is which today would be uh, 14 times 5, which gives us, what, 70, right? Then you would read from Psalm 70 through Psalm 74, because there are 150 Psalms. So what you do is it you read the, the proverb of the day, multiply f- by 5, and what you do is you read through the Psalms and Proverbs once a month. Then what you do is you begin either in the Old or the New Testament and you read five chapters. And then you will read the Bible in a year and you will read Psalms and Proverbs every month. Psalms is the songbook of the, of the Bible. It's a time of praise. It's a time of worship. It's also Proverbs is the instruction in wisdom. So hopefully we spend time praising God in his presence. We spend time um, learning God's wisdom in the way 
to um, learn God's ways. That roughly takes about 45 minutes if you're a slow reader like me, okay? And I do that, it's easy, because I could do it, I, I read a book, I like a book, I, I, I have version in an app, I have it on my iPad and things like that, but I do prefer, prefer a paper book. Okay, so if you like that, you want to try that, that's fine. Or if you have something else, we want to encourage you in that. Also on your table is a little prayer of illumination. Um, Sherry brought this into staff this week. And we want this to be kind of a bookmark for you or something that you take home. Wherever you do your devos, I have a little spot where I do mine. Just put this there and I would just pray this and um, read this. Because what we do is what God gave us in the Bible is special revelation. What we get out of it is illumination. A lot of people say, oh, I got a revelation. Technically, what we're getting is illumination. So this is a prayer that when you read scripture, that God would speak to you through it. And that's our gift to you. And you could use it as a mark and you could thank Sherry for it. Is that good? Good. Thank you, Jess. Okay, so as we looked at the scripture today, and this is really apropos to what we're going through because Jesus uses the word of God um, a lot. But we're going to talk about something um, I know a lot about, maybe you do too, but we're going to talk about this idea of evil. Oh, and what we're seeing here in the scriptures is Jesus is going off into the wilderness and he's been fasting for 40 days. And if you look at her in the text, he's become hungry. Now, when you go on long fasts, if you've ever done any long periods of fasting, usually it takes about three days, and your appetite kind of stalls. It's really bizarre. Um, and, and most of your, your, your eating after, at least, especially like six or seven days, it is, it, it's out of just kind of habit. You're no longer hungry. But what happens when you, when you fast for long, long periods of time, when your hunger returns, it's usually when you're supposed to eat again because your body is going to a critical state. And that's where Jesus is at this time. He hasn't eaten for 40 days, and now he's starting to become hungry. And what that is is his body saying, this is a new level of shutting down. You need to get something to eat. It's very, 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 very critical. And what we see is the devil begins to approach him. Now, many people are like, come on, we're 21st century Americans. We have the interweb. We, we don't believe in a devil. You believe in a devil? And the answer is yes. You really can't be a biblical Christian unless you do. Jesus talks more about this kind of stuff than virtually anything else, really. And Jesus is having a conversation with an intelligent evil. And what we need to understand is evil is very, it's complicated. I've told you this story before, but a number of years ago, I used to spend, um, my Mondays in retreat at a Catholic retreat center um, over um, by the camp by campus called um, Christ the King, and it's an it's an old kind of. It used to, I think it might had some monastic work, and it's a large mansion that they put dormitories on and stuff. And I would spend my whole day there, and just prayer and and and, and doing spiritual disciplines and things like that. And one day I was there, and the lady who ran it was always trying to convert me back to being a Catholic because I was raised Catholic. I was confirmed Catholic too, so it's an easy to slip me back in there, I guess. But anyway, there was a, a retreat for deacons and, and priests, and she signed me up for it, and um, I went in, and she told me she signed me up for it, but I don't have to go, but you get a free lunch, so lunch I was in. So I went down, and here are all these priests, and I walked in on my street clothes, and they must be like, uh-oh, must be a new rebel priest, you know, in the diocese, and I'm, no, I'm free Methodist. Well, anyway, I ate lunch and I was talking to a bunch of priests. And one of the fellows who was at my table was, he was ancient. He was like 140. Um, but he was still very, very bright. And we were talking about just stuff. And these guys are so well trained. Uh, it's a shame they don't get to really preach. You know, they do those little 10 minute homilies and stuff like that. But they were just really interesting to talk to. And the guy got up to get a cup of coffee and he offered to get me a cup of coffee. And I was like, sure. And one of the guys leaned forward and says, you don't know who he is, do you? I'm like, no. He's like, oh, he's been a priest forever. And he's telling me about where he was, a, you know, he was, I guess, a, a priest of renown in the Syracuse diocese. And he said, but it's really interesting. He was the driver for the chief justice during the Nuremberg trials. I'm like, get out of town, really? They're like, yeah, he was a, he was a I think he was like a major during World War II. So he was, he was older. This is only about 10 or 15 years ago. 
And I'm like, really? And they're like, oh yeah, he, if you ever see a documentary on the Nuremberg trials, if you look at the, where the chief justice sits, you'll see him sitting off to the side in a chair. And when they would, when they would you know, dismiss, he would walk out. And, and so he comes down and I'm like, I gotta ask the guy about it. I'm like, is this true? And he was like, yeah. And he told me that he actually got, the car that he drove was Hermann Goering's 12 cylinder Mercedes. And he said every once in a while, the chief justice would be like, take it out on the Autobahn and, and like open it up, you know, and he just let the thing go ripping down there. So I was like, well, that's really cool. You got to, to drive Hermann Goering's car, but you were in a room with him. He's like, yeah, I was in a room. Yeah, I was in the room with Goering before he committed suicide. And, and all of those high ranking Nazis. And he's like, yeah. I'm like, what were they like? And he goes, they were kind of like just normal people, but they were really dressed shabby. They're kind of shabby people. And you would think the architects who orchestrated one of the biggest, well, at least well-known atrocities in the history of the world, when they showed up, they'd be like, have horns sticking out of their head and tails and you know, fingernails with fire shooting out of them. And he was like, no, they were kind of shabby. And it's like, that amount of evil, that amount of awful atrocity came out of some dismissive humans? And the answer is, yeah. They didn't come in Riding a broom, they didn't come in with horns sticking out of their head or fangs or foaming at the mouth. They came in fairly orderly, and sat down, fairly articulate. But they were evil. And they perpetrated more evil than probably this world's almost ever seen. And they just looked normal. Look like me and you. And evil, it's, it's, it's complicated. And now we, we look at evil in a way where it's more so, not something that we deal with. It's more external. We look at evil in a more syst uh, systemic way or it's a systems way. And there's a huge push about, you know, ridding systems of evil, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, the way that most people want to deal with it today was, is with deconstructionism. They want to take, blow everything up, they want to <laughs> destroy this and destroy that and destroy this. And, and some of those things, sometimes houses get so infested with rats, they need to be burnt down. But most of the time, they just need to be reformed. And uh, there's a big movement, like you'll see now, with deconstructing everything. The problem is when you take things apart is that someone needs to go put it back together. Um, and when you do take something apart, usually what you just dealt with is a lot of broken parts. And systems are what, what, what keeps civilization moving. Uh, we can't do without them. And when we look at evil today, that's how we mainly look at it. But when we're, when we're looking to this whole deal here... A Christian point of view when we deal with evil is much more comprehensive than that. So I'd like to look at first is the idea of the taxonomy of, of evil or how it's kind of classified or how complex it really is. And I remember hearing uh, Tim Keller talk about a time when FDR was up on the Hudson, um, uh, you know, during the latter parts of World War II, pretty much probably right before his death. And... Um, his Episcopal priest asked them what he was reading. And he said, Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard. And he said, really? He says, yes. And I'm trying to grapple with how the most sophisticated, well-funded, most educated, the society that gave us the research university can do what they did in Germany. Because most of the time, when you look at the way we deal with evil, we say, well, what we got to do is educate the people out of it. Or what we got to do is fund the way out of it. Or what we have to do is give them opportunities out of it. 
But what we see is evil is, is, in, 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 is, is much more complex than that. Biblically, we see that there is evil in the world. And we see that. And that evil is outside of us, and it's pushing against us, and it's resisting us. Then we see that there's evil inside of us. It's in our flesh. There's evil that we deal with. And then we see that there is, there is more evil outside of us in the devil and his minions. And they're try, constantly trying to come from the outside of us to get into us in one way, shape, or form. The interesting thing about evil is the sum of evil is greater than its parts. So here's this person looking at Hermann Göring and looking at these people, and he's saying, they don't, they don't look terribly powerful. But when you put all these people together, you put all this evil together, it, the sum of it is greater than its parts. You look back through our history, you know, through Jim Crow laws and things like that, and you, 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 you talk to people who are involved in that, and you're like, but they're not really that awful. But yet, when you put all of what they're doing together, the sum is greater than its parts. And evil has that tendency to do that. So it's very complicated. Well, what are some of the tactics of evil? How do we see it? And most of the time, evil comes to us in, 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 a, in a biblical form, and it comes to us usually with a Faustian deal. Now, Faustus was... It's a, it's a German text where a certain kind of alchemist is challenged by the devil, and he basically says, I will give you wisdom and riches, but what I want in return is your soul. Faustian is you get something, but you give up something usually of greater value. You see this biblically with the story between Jacob and Esau. Jacob, everybody goes, oh, Esau stole his, I mean, uh, Jacob stole Esau's blessing. He didn't, just set, he didn't just steal his blessing. He stole his birthright. And it was a Faustian deal. Jacob knew what his brother was like. So he was out doing his thing, running around. He was very kind of in-your-face kind of guy. And Jacob realizes when he comes home, he's going to be hungry. And I'm going to make something that he loves to eat. And Esau comes in, this is Genesis 25, and there's Jacob making some stew, red stew, it says. And Esau's like, give me some of that. He's like, no. He's like, give me some of that. He says, I'll give you this for your birthright. And what does he say? What good's my birthright if I die of hunger? Have it. Jacob gets the birthright, he gets stew. Faustian deal. You get something, but you give up something of greater value. And that's what, most of the time, that's how evil comes to us. Saying, listen, I'm going to give you something, but I'm going to take something. I'm going to extrapolate something from you of greater value. And in the text that we saw, what happens is Satan appears to Jesus when what? He's hungry. When he's at his weakest point. By the way, the devil does not play fair. This is the same being that tempts pedophiles, that tempts murderers. It's the same being that empowers them to do what they do and incites them to do it. And here's Jesus, and he's hungry, and he comes to Jesus, and what does he say to him? Why don't you make the rocks brick? Uh, why don't you make the rock, rocks bread? You're hungry, make bread. What's wrong with that? Jesus made sandwiches for five thousand people. Why can't he make bread for himself? What's the big deal? Do some magic. Whip up some bread, Jesus. Do it for yourself. What's the problem with that? 
Jesus never did miracles for himself. Jesus did everything he did through miraculous for everyone else. He did it for you and me. That's why the gospel is not your life for me. It's my life for you. And Satan comes around and he begins to move in our life in, in the life of addictive behavior. It's always halt. When you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, or you're tired. Jesus was hungry. We know he was out there by himself. And let me tell you, when you don't eat for a number, well, at least 40 days, you're tired. He was at least three of those four things. I don't know if he was angry. And usually we have our biggest problems resisting temptation and not sinning during halt when we're hungry, when we're angry, when we're lonely, or when we're tired. And that's when Satan comes to Jesus and he says, why don't you make yourself some bread? And Jesus is like, no, I'm not here to serve myself. And then he comes to him. And most of the time when we're tempted by the devil, we're not tempted to necessarily do very evil things. We're just told, we're just very often tempted to do good things that are inappropriate for its time. Nothing wrong with making bread. Then he says to Jesus, well, why don't you worship me and um, I'll give you what you want. I'll give you authority and I'll give you power because it was given to me. And he says to him, well, you know, and matter of fact, if you see all these kingdoms, I'll give those to you too. And he's basically saying to Jesus, I'll give you what you're here to do without the cross. I'll let you do what you came to do with no pain. I'll let you get what you want by easy street. But you're going to give up something. It's your allegiance. It's your soul. And most of the time when we're tempted, it's a lie. And most sin in our life becomes with believing the lie. I can't do without this. If I do this, it'll be easier. Yeah, I know it's not the best, but it... And we know how that feels. And what happens is Satan uses two tactics with us. And I stole this again from Tim Keller. He uses temp uh, temptation and accusation. Usually what happens in here, it's like, hey, you're tired, you're hungry, Jesus. Why don't you have some bread? And you know it. You're tired, you're hungry. Ah, you Listen, you're good. God loves you anyway. You can do whatever you want. God's going to love you. And then you go do what Satan tempts you to do. And he's like, aha, loser. Gotcha. Look how awful you are. You are the worst. God's never going to love you. Look at you. Oh, my goodness. You disobeyed God. And you're a Christian. Oh, my. I would never go to church again if I was you. How could you show your face? Temptation and accusation. And what happens to us is when we do something wrong, we feel conviction of the Holy Spirit. And Satan hops on that with accusation and turns conviction into condemnation. Yeah, you messed up, but you know what you are? You're a loser. You're horrible. God will never forgive you. Look how broken you are. You might as well just cash it in. And we listen to that. Instead of God saying, I know what you did, but I love you. I know what you did, get back up. There's more blood and there's more grace than you could ever imagine. And that's what we deal with. And we usually listen to the enemy, we listen to the devil, and then we listen to his accusations. You're such a loser, you're no good. So you're the taxonomy of evil, the tactics of the evil, and then how we triumph over evil. 
What does Jesus do? We know what Jesus could do. When Peter broke out his sword and lopped off someone's ear, he wasn't going for the ear, by the way. It would have been a really wild um, uh, miracle if he replaced his head. But um, Jesus says to him, are you kidding me? I got 12 legions of angels I could call down here. Jesus is saying, I have the power to nuke this place, and I'm not. So we know Jesus was a lot more powerful than Satan. You know, Jesus could have just blinked and made him cease to exist if he felt like it. But in the justice and the economy of God, he begins to respond to every temptation, or test is the better word, with Scripture. With Scripture. Scripture was so important to Jesus that he committed it to memory. And he didn't just commit it to memory, it became part of who he was. Anytime Jesus was in a situation and it was high pressure, painful, embarrassing, humiliating, what came out of his mouth? Scripture. On the cross? That's all he's coming out of his mouth. And if it was that important to Jesus, shouldn't it be that important to us? When you squeeze Jesus... He bled and sweat Scripture. But we'd rather read something else. We'd rather read something more important and more relevant, more culturally relevant today. Oh, please, please. Really? Why don't we just get really honest? We don't like Scripture. Because when we read it, it reads us. When you look at it, it looks back at you. And we don't read Scripture because we don't have the guts to do it. We think we know better. And I think most of us do know better than God. Right? Jesus read it. And he bled it. And he sweat it. And if you're going to conquer evil, and you're going to do battle with the devil, and you're going to overcome things in your life, you're not going to do it without Scripture. And you're not going to do it without letting Scripture become part of who you are. Because the way the enemy messes with you, he gets into your head, and then he makes it what, what's in your head fall into your heart. Because Proverbs 23 says, as a person thinks in their heart, so are they. And Jesus is taking the conversation that Satan is putting into his head and he's pushing it out with Scripture. And he's saying, Scripture is training the way I think. Scripture is redoing what's in my heart. And if we today in the 21st century think because we have computers and we live in a digital age of information and we think that's going to replace Scripture, I'm here to tell you, it's not. I'm sorry, it's not. And if we're going to be the church that God wants in the 21st century, we need to become people of the book. A few weeks ago, I started reading some Puritan writers. And I decided I'm going to become a Puritan. So if you see me dressed as a pilgrim, out of, not around Thanksgiving, sorry, it's just what I'm into right now. And so uh, now I had read some John Owen and, and, and you know, some of the commentaries, these are Matthew Henry, these are Puritans. One, one of the Puritans is John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. 
And John Owen at the time was this incredible theologian, wrote uh, books and books and books. And he was a theologian, and he was trying to get to a point where he could hear John Bunyan preach. And John Bunyan was, was self-educated. He was known as the tinker from Bedford. He was not a very you know, well-spoken or brilliant man. And Owen was trying to get to hear him. And I believe it was the Archbishop of Canterbury. He says, why are you going through all this trouble to go listen to the tinker of Bedford? And he said, if I could explain the gospel like that man, I would consider it an accomplishment. And if you cut him, if you cut him, he would bleed Biblin. If you cut him, he would bleed the Bible. And I was like, I don't know how many years left I got. But that's what I want. Because that's the way my Lord was. And I wonder why the devil bests me. And I wonder why I fall into sin and I make stupid decisions and I make mistakes and I do dumb things. I'll always do that. But I'll do it a lot less if I immerse myself in God's scriptures. And if you cut me, I would bleed midline. And as a church, we have this incredible special revelation that God had given, that God has given to us. And most of us just go, put it on a shelf somewhere. But here we see Jesus standing toe to toe with the devil. He doesn't break out a lightsaber. He doesn't break out a gun. doesn't do some mumbo-jumbo, reads the scriptures. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying this is some magic book. And you wave it around, or if you quote it, it's like open sesame and everything opens. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that in that book is the word of God, and God will speak to you through it, and God will take those words that you take in through your eyes, that you think about in your head, and will put them in your heart. As a church, we are picking up the sword of the Spirit, the word of God. As your pastor, it is the best tool that you have to live out the Christian faith victoriously and triumphantly as we fight in this world that we live in. So here's some next steps for this coming week. This week, I will ask God to forgive me and be Lord of my life. That's you if you need to commit or recommit your life to Christ. Please check that if you want to talk about it. I'd love to talk to you about it. Or this week, I will ask God, help me see where evil comes from. Maybe you don't believe me. Maybe you think I'm doing something goofy up here. Talk to God. Let God show you. I dare you. Or maybe this is you. This week, I'll ask God, show me the power script, uh, show me the Show me the power of Scripture in my daily life. Some of us need that. I needed that. You know how many books I read? You know how many books I have? Ask God to show you the power of His book. So let's pray as you choose one of these next steps. Lord, thank you for your continued goodness and mercy to us. Lord, help us to love your word. Help us to see its power to transform us and prepare us for battle. Help us see the comfort that rests in there. Most of all, help us to see that it's a special revelation that you've given to each and every one of us of you. So be with us as we've chosen one of these next steps this week. 
I pray that in Christ's name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Pastor Jess? Oh, that's right. Oh, that's right. Today we have our offering.